Y'all doing okay? Good. I didn't realize this was the inaugural uh, speaker series, so either we'll set the bar really high or it's going to be so bottom level that it's nowhere to go but up, but we're going to have a great time. But I really am, uh, I'm really honored to be invited to join uh, you guys today, get invited to uh, speak and visit with a lot of different groups and don't have the time to, to do all of them. But when this request came through, this was a no brainer um, and, and really wanted to come over here and visit with all of you as well. So appreciate you being here and, and hope everybody is doing is doing well. So, you know, leadership obviously is something that I've thought a lot about and, and realize the role that I'm in right now as the head football coach is a is a leadership role in so many different uh, so many different ways. But to me, when somebody said well, your leadership style, to me that is something that that's really developed over my entire life, and it goes back to the people that I was around growing up. My mom, my dad. You know, I think back to when I was in high school and the, the, the high school football coach that I played for and the high school baseball coach that I played for. And all of those people are, <clears throat> are shaping my philosophy, my style, because I believe at the end of the day, your leadership style is, is, is your personality and just being yourself. I read everybody knows who Tony Dungy is, I'm sure, a longtime NFL coach. And, and I'll never forget him saying one time, you know, Tony Dungy on the sidelines as the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts was very just calm, uh, not a lot of emotion, very not laid back, but but somewhat even keeled, low key and, and not a lot of emotion. And, and I remember him saying one time that if they were successful, the Colts, if they won football games, it was going to be because of that leadership style. And then if they didn't and they were struggling and losing games, then people would say, well, he's not fiery enough, and he's not this, and he's not that, and we need this. So to me, it's just being yourself, being you, being genuine. I can't, I've worked for a lot of great coaches, Hall of Fame coaches. I've been around a lot of different leadership styles, but if I try and act like um, Kirby Smart, who I worked for at Georgia, or I try and act like Lincoln Riley, who I worked for at Oklahoma, or be identical to my dad, it's not going to work because to me, being a leader is, is being authentic and being genuine and not being fake and, and being me. And so many people, when they come through our football facility, whether it be recruits or, or players or whoever, families, that's the one thing that always comes back is, wow, you guys, meaning the staff that I have, and then myself are really genuine. That's the word that, that always comes back, which to me is a compliment because it's saying that you're, you're real is the way that I see it. And, and so that shaped me a lot growing up and just being me. And then as I got into college, I went to school at Virginia Tech and, and finally was a part of college athletics at the highest level playing football <clears throat> at Virginia Tech for my dad. So one from him, seeing him, obviously I grew up as his son, now playing for him in college, I got to see his leadership style as a head coach, which was very similar to what it was as a dad. Consistent, steady, uh, treating people right, treating people fairly. Uh, he did the same thing as a head coach, and that had a big impact on me. And then just seeing the different styles of leadership that we had on our football team. Our last season, or my last year in college, we played for the national championship game, lost to Florida State in the national championship game, uh, my last game ever in college. And, and we had two distinct leaders on that football team. One was a guy that probably everybody in here, her, here has heard of, Michael Vick, former quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons and, and, and other teams. Mike didn't say a, ho a whole lot, but just his talent level alone and the way that he carried himself naturally just made him a leader that people wanted to follow. And then we had another guy that, unless you're a diehard football fan, you've probably never heard the name, but Corey Moore was his name. And Corey Moore was a defensive end, All-American. Um, there's still, everybody in here is, is Gamecocks, obviously, there's still footage of 1998, uh, Virginia Tech played Clemson on a Thursday night in Blacksburg, Virginia, and, and Corey Moore single-handedly dominated that game and won that game. So. If you got some downtime, I encourage you to go to YouTube and look up Corey Moore highlights from the Clemson game in 1998. But Corey was a ferocious football player, but just unbelievable leader in two different styles. Mike Vick hardly ever said a word, but his talent and the way he carried himself made him a leader. Corey Moore said a lot, 
and his play on the field backed it up. So I saw two different styles of leadership on that football team. And then I got into coaching in the year 2000 was my first year ever. I was a graduate assistant at Georgia Tech. And all the different coaches that I worked with over the next 20 some years until I came here to this position of a leadership position here at South Carolina from uh, George O'Leary, the head coach at Georgia Tech my first year in 2000, to Philip Fulmer at the University of Tennessee, then coming here with Steve Spurrier, then going to Virginia Tech and working for my dad, then going to Georgia and working for Kirby Smart, then going to Oklahoma and working for Lincoln Riley. Every single one of those coaches are great leaders and successful coaches, but they're all different. And go back to what I said a minute ago, it's not about trying to be like one of those guys and saying, man, Kirby Smart wins a lot of football games at George. I'm going to try and be just like Kirby Smart and emulate him. It doesn't work that way. And are there parts of his personality, parts of his program that, that I've probably uh, uh, implemented into my own leadership style and our program? Sure. But you could say that about all of them. But all along that time, I knew that I ultimately wanted to be a head football coach and, and wanted it to be here. So all during that time that I'm working at those programs, I'm shaping not just my leadership style, but okay, if I ever get the opportunity to be a head football coach, this is the things that I want, these are the things that I want our program to be about. This is how we're gonna practice, always planning and preparing. This is how we're gonna do this. This is how we're gonna do that. This is what the staff's gonna look like. <clears throat> so you're preparing for all those things and then developing that leadership style as you take the good and the bad from all the different coaches that I worked with. And same thing in your situation right now, all the different people you're around and the leaders that you're around and taking the good and the bad from all of those guys and constantly learning, but constantly preparing. And, and that's what I was. And I'm, I'm a crazy note taker. I write down everything and, and all during that time, just constantly writing stuff down, things I liked, things I didn't like, lessons learned, uh, always preparing for that opportunity when you're in a leadership position. And then a year ago, or a little over a year ago, is when I got hired here. And first of all, to me, now that I'm the leader of the football program, the head football coach, is I needed to know about the people that I'm leading, the people in our football program, and the environment that I was walking into as the head football coach. So, you know, I've said it publicly before and talked about it. When I got hired, the first thing I did, there's a lot of things that needed to get done as soon as I took the job, recruiting, and, and I was still coaching at Oklahoma, and we had a, a Big 12 championship game we were gonna play in as well. But priority number one for me before anything, before hiring a coaching staff, was meeting with the current players on the football team in December of 2020. So I did that <clears throat> immediately and had over 100 meetings with every single player on the team from starting quarterback to somebody that just walked on and, has, and had never even dressed out for a game. Just to sit down with them and, and get to know them on a personal level and, and not just talk about football, but talk about their families, talk about where they're from, talk about what they're majoring in, what their academic interests are in outside of what they're majoring in, goals after college, all that stuff, why they chose to come to the University of South Carolina. But then I'll also talk to all of them about why or what are, what are the issues here? What needs to change? Why, you know, I flat out said it, why are we a to win team right now? Why is the coach that you came here to play for, why did he get fired and, and I'm now sitting in this office as the head football coach? And a lot of things kept coming back to me. And after those meetings, <clears throat> there were you know a lot of things that came from it. The, the core values that I wanted our program to be about, obviously were very things I had in mind, but then these answers came back to me and it made it very evident the things that, that, that these core values that I had in mind were what we needed to be about, but also what they needed from me as the leader of this program. And, you know, some of those was this, the, the team mentality. And whether you're a head football coach or the manager of a restaurant or, or whatever it may be, CEO of a company, you're in a leadership position, I think it's important to have and develop that team mentality. And in college athletics, in today's time, it's harder and harder to do that because of 
name, image, and likeness, and the transfer portal, and on and on and on. Coaches being able to you know take other jobs and go other places and things like that. So it's it was a challenge, but I knew that we needed to really develop even more so the team mentality, team bonding, things that we were able to do outside the facility was something that I felt like as a leader we needed to do. It was harder in last year's time because of all the COVID restrictions, but the more things that we could do together as a football team and as a football program, players, coaches, families, everybody, uh, the better. Uh, I think as a leader, and I know that I try and do this now, is just the positive energy that you that I try and convey each and every day in the facility, on the practice field, and, and, and that's important. And don't get me wrong, it's not good all the time. I mean, we had some things at practice this morning that, that weren't good, that if you saw me, you're like, that ain't very positive what you're saying and the way you're acting. Um, and I have to catch myself, but I think there's a difference between, I know there's a difference between positive energy and negative energy. And, and when we got beat by Texas A&M badly on the road this year, there wasn't a lot of great positivity, high-fiving and all that stuff in the locker room after the game. But there's a difference. You can be non-negative in those situations. And that's what we tried to do, not just after that game, but, but every every game this year, win or lose. But I know that when I walk in that facility each day as the leader, as the head coach of the program, <clears throat> all eyes are on me. And a lot of people are gonna go as I go. So making sure that I'm trying to convey that positivity and that positive energy, no matter what is going on, that there's adversity happening, there's bad things happening, but there's some good that can come out of this as well. Accountability as a leader is huge and, and, and something else that the football team when I got hired told me they felt like they needed more of and was, I knew that already as a leader I had to hold people accountable but the football team is telling me they wanted more of that it's a core value of our program and, and holding them accountable for everything and it's easy when the players tell me this that they want accountability because even a year later, if things aren't getting done the right way on and off the field, I'm, e I'm able to go to them, which is I did in a team meeting recently, and be able to say, you guys told me you wanted accountability. We're holding you accountable. This is what you told me you needed. So that part is fantastic. We showed our guys a video of the Denver Broncos a few weeks ago. They fired their head coach after the season, and they did like a behind-the-scenes access look of the search to find – the new football coach for the Denver Broncos. And one of the initial meetings was the, own, the owner, the general manager, all the people that were in the decision-making process. And one of the guys in this meeting said, you know, I've talked to all the players on our football team. The one thing they told me that they want more of in our new head coach is accountability. And these are millionaires playing football at the highest level that are saying, we want you to hold us accountable. So I believe that when you're in a leadership role, you have to hold the people around you uh, accountable. And then we needed to, no matter what I do as a leader, no matter what uh, you guys, when you're in a leadership position, if you're at the top, do, unless you have great leadership from the people on your team, in your organization, it's gonna be hard. So we needed to develop the leadership within our football team. I tell our guys, not often, because I don't like talking about another SEC program, but I've told them the story before when I was at Georgia. My first year as an assistant coach at the University of Georgia was 2016. And we went seven and five, I think that year in the regular season, lost to Vanderbilt. Uh, our very first season at Georgia, lost to Vanderbilt at home, lost to Georgia Tech at home, barely beat Nichols State uh, in the second game of the season, University of Georgia. And the very next season is when Georgia wins the SEC, wins the Rose Bowl, and would have won the national championship if it hadn't been for a second and 26 uh, pass by Alabama in the national championship game. But it was the same team, like literally the same team other than a true freshman quarterback by the name of Jake Fromm came in and played quarterback. But other than Jake, the same players were back. The one difference was the leadership, period, in the story. Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle, Roquan Smith, guys that 
were somewhat leaders on that 2016 team, but not really the leaders of the team. The leaders of the 2016 team were good, don't get me wrong, but not great. But from the time that team came back in January of 2017, we won the AutoZone Liberty Bowl against TCU uh, to, to, to finish the season. And then when that football team came back two weeks later to start the spring semester, it was a different team solely because of the leadership of the older guys on that team. So your team, your company, your organization, your business is going to go as the leadership goes from the top and then the people that are on that team as leaders as leaders as well. I think listening is a very, 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 very underrated aspect of, of being a leader. I think people sometimes think, okay, when you're in a leadership position, that all you do is, is talk. And some of the most powerful things for me are, are listening. Those individual meetings that I have with those players and hearing the things they're telling me as well. Not just you know, having a meeting to have a meeting, but truly listening and learning from the things that you're hearing as well. I think when you're in a leadership position, being able to have empathy for the people around you, having compassion, caring for the people that you're leading. Yes, I'm the head coach, but it's, it's, I've got we've got 110 players currently on our football team, and they are just like you and any other college student or any person in any organization. Everybody has issues. Everybody has problems. I have things that you know, I deal with. So it's not just coaching football when you're in this position. There's a lot of other things on your plate. I wish all I did was coach football and, and recruit, but when you're in a position like this, you don't. I mean, I'm in the middle of working on football yesterday morning, and a player came in my office literally crying. Shut the door. He said, Coach, I feel like I'm having a breakdown. I need to talk. We talked for an hour. Got his mom on the phone. Those are the things that you can't isolate yourself when you're in a leadership position. You have to be visible. You have to be connected. You have to care. The people that you're leading have to know that you care about them first and foremost. I can't just get up there and, and scream and yell and, and recruit players and, and go coach football. It's more than that. They're not going to play for you. They're not going to want to work for you. They're not going to want to be led by you if they don't know that you truly you know, care about them and that you're going to treat people right. Um, being visible as a leader. Uh, I'm a guy, um, you know, Justin King is our phenomenal uh, creative media leader, does everything for us. It's here videoing right now. Justin will tell you this in our facility, like rarely am I just sitting in my office. Like I love to just be around the building and visible. If I'm sitting at my office, it's probably just because I'm sitting there watching videotape of an opponent or practice tape of practice from that day before. But when I am in there, that door is always open. And even something as simple as, you know, my wife has like three jars of candy and potato chips and things like that that sit in my office. And the players come in there all the time and they act like they're coming in there just to see me and visit with me. They're really just coming in there to like steal candy and steal chocolate and steal potato chips. But it, I don't care. It's an opportunity every day for a player to come in my office and sit down and just visit with me, even if it's just for 20 seconds. And those little moments like that are, are so powerful. And be, I don't want to be a guy that sits in my office with the door shut. And this is not to knock anybody that was in this position that I'm in right now before me. But when I had a lot of those meetings, when I first got hired, there were a bunch of players that walked in that office that said, this is the first time I've ever been in this head coach's office. And again, that's not to knock anybody. Different people's styles are different people's styles. I don't want to be that way. I want you always to come in this office. I mean, there's times they'll come in there and there'll be guys just sitting on the couch watching basketball or watching football and just, just hanging out. And I'm constantly around that building as well. Be where the people you're leading are. So for us, it's other than being on the practice field, it's in the locker room with them and where they eat their meals in our facility, being able to go down there and just eat meals with them. One thing we wanted to do before, when I got hired, was a lot of the players would get their food and then they would just go in the locker room and just eat in their lockers by themselves. We cut that out. You're gonna sit down and you're gonna sit at tables and you're all gonna to eat together and we're gonna to get to know each other and the coaches are gonna be down there and the staff and that's how you develop those relationships. So be invisible and not, not invisible, be visible and not just hold up in your office uh, 
in some pedestal where you're different than everybody else. Coming down to where the people you lead are, I think is critical and, and being around, being able to have conversations and talk to people. My dad used to say this all the time when he was, my dad was the head football coach at Virginia Tech for 29 years. And he used to always say this to his coaching staff when he talked about dealing with the players. He said, work every day for the crisis. Meaning at some point there's going to be a crisis at some point during the season or something out of season off the field, the crap is going to hit the fan. And it's too late at that point to rally the troops and think that you have everybody together. You better be building those relationships. You better be doing that on the front end as well, working every day for the crisis for when it, for when it comes. Being consistent and being steady. Some of these head coaches I've, I've been around, and again, I've been around some great ones, but I've also worked for guys that every day they walked into the facility or into work, you didn't know which guy you were going to get. And you had to be on, tip, on eggshells, kind of tiptoeing, trying to figure out what mood this guy is in that day. Is he going to be up here and he's great and, and everybody wants to be around him? Or he's going to be down here and he's screaming and yelling at everybody and MFing people and, and all that stuff as well. I never wanted to be that guy. I think the, the, the consistency day in, day out is, is critical when you're in a leadership position. There's so many things that come across my desk each and every day that I don't prepare for, meaning I didn't expect this to happen. And it's easy to get off schedule and get off kilter. It's easy to say, oh my God, you know, how are we gonna overcome this? But taking the mindset of a glass half full mindset and then just being consistent. I talked about after that Texas A&M game or any game. So when we play a game on Saturday, uh, we immediately, we, on Sundays, we meet with the staff. I, I do as the head coach. We have a staff meeting on Sunday afternoons. And then following that staff meeting, we have a team meeting where the whole team is in there. And those Sunday afternoons are, are critical because there are some great wins that we're coming in that building after on a Sunday. And there's some really brutal losses that we've come into that building at on a Sunday. And my mindset, my demeanor is going to really, in so many ways, set the tone for everybody in that organization. If I get up there after we've lost a game and I'm like this, we're talking about all the bad things that happened the day, the day before, it's probably not going to go well. But if we come in there and we talk about the things that happened and where, where it went wrong, how we can be better, what we're going to learn from it, we try and learn from everything. Win, every win, every loss, we try and learn from it. But it's a big chat, not a challenge, but it's a huge responsibility knowing that every single day, particularly on a Sunday after a game, my demeanor, my mindset with the staff and with the players is huge for just setting, setting the direction for that week uh, as well. We talked a minute ago, or I talked a minute ago about creating leadership within your team and, and the different ways that you can do that. You know, for us, we have a leadership committee on our football team where the guys that either kind of a combination of definitely are leaders or guys that we really need to become leaders. Uh, it's a select group and, and we have that committee where we meet with those guys during the season. There's a lot of things that happen uh, throughout the year in the weight room, uh, 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 in summer conditioning when you're getting ready for the football season when the coaches aren't out there where that leadership naturally happens and grows. And, and then you want it to happen that way. I mean, one of the things from today that if somebody had been at practice said, well, that's not very positive, Shane, was I was upset because I didn't think our offense was doing a great job against our defense at a certain part in practice today. Uh, they're frankly getting their butts kicked and there was no leadership from the offense. And we've got a bunch of returning players on that offense. And I was encouraging them, begging them for somebody to speak up and lead. Like I'm not going to be out there cheerleading and all that stuff on the field with you guys during games. It's your team. And the best teams I've been around are the ones that are led by the players uh, as well. You know, um, I talked about how I was constantly trying to prepare for this opportunity and I'd always go around and try and learn from others, not just where I was coaching and taking notes, but watching other coaches and going other places and, and visit, visiting uh, different programs, different teams. And, and one time I went and visited the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars NFL football team. And the head coach at the time was a guy by the name of Gus Bradley. 
And Gus Bradley, uh, uh, I think he's fantastic. He didn't have the success that he wanted in Jacksonville. He's with, he was with the Chargers. I think he's with the Colts now as their defensive coordinator. But phenomenal personnel person, per, excuse me, phenomenal person, phenomenal mindset. And one thing he said to me really resonated. He used to work for Pete Carroll, the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. And he told me that when he went and visited the, to interview for the job with Pete Carroll to be his defensive coordinator of the Seattle Seahawks, he sat down in the job interview with Coach Carroll, a legendary coach, obviously won national championships at Southern Cal and uh, has been highly successful with the Seahawks. But he said he sat down and the first question wasn't about that Pete Carroll asked Gus Bradley was not about football, family. He said, what is your mission statement as a coach and as a leader. And Gus Bradley was like, my mission statement? You mean like a company, like organization type mission statement? And Pete Carroll said, yeah. Like I, Pete Carroll has his own mission statement. And he asked Gus Bradley, what is yours? And Gus Bradley told me, he's like, it hit me with a ton of, like a ton of bricks. I didn't have one, but he said it was so clear to me because then I went back and put together a mission statement for what Gus Bradley wanted to be about as at that time an assistant coach for the Seattle Seahawks but to me that mission statement is more than just I want to have the top defense in the NFL it's what it, it's the the characteristics you want to have as a person and and whatnot and then he carried that on to his time as the head coach with the Jacksonville Jaguars where he had a he had a mission statement and it made sense to me, you know, to have a mission statement as an individual student at South Carolina. But as you grow into leadership positions, what you want to be about as a leader and constantly being able to refer to that uh, to remind you of why you're doing what you do and, and what you're doing it for as well. Um, Bill Walsh, the longtime NFL head coach with the with the 49ers, he, he wrote a book uh, called the, the, the Score Takes Care of Itself. And it's essentially, you know, kind of his thoughts about being a leader. And some of these I've already touched on, but he had 12, and, and they make sense to me. Won multiple Super Bowls with the San Francisco 49ers, invented or created the West Coast offense that you hear about in football as well. But that's so simple. But Bill Walsh said his 12 things was be yourself, which goes back to what I said at the beginning about being genuine and, and your personality, your style is your style. Don't try and be somebody you're not. Being committed to excellence. When we, we, I want our football program to be the best in the country and, and be committed to being the very best in everything that we do. Number three that Bill Walsh said was be positive. We talked about that. Number four thing he had was to be a great leader was being prepared. And it's being prepared for that opportunity when it comes. If I had just all of a sudden Ray Tanner calls me and offer, our athletic director just calls and offers me the job as the head football coach of South Carolina and I hadn't been preparing for years for that opportunity, it wouldn't have gone well. I had been preparing for that job interview for years, for the opportunity to be the head football coach. So be prepared, you know, for those opportunities. Be detail oriented. Um, you know, I'm not a anal micromanager, but I try and be very detailed and about every aspect of our program that nothing slips, nothing slides, whether it be uh, if we want every player dressed the same way at practice with white socks, that if we got one guy out there with black socks on, He's not going to practice. He's going to go in there and he's going to get his white socks on or whatever the rule is that we come up with as a team. Being organized, I think the people are not think I know the people that you uh, lead appreciate organization from a leader uh, that he's on top of it. He knows what's going on. He's not all over the place. Um, it used to it used to drive me crazy. I love Lincoln Riley, the new head coach of Southern Cal to death, but it used to drive me crazy when I was working for him because you know, you'd finish practice or whatever, and you're in your office working, and you, you have, I don't know, meetings with players. You basically got the afternoon to do what you need to do, and then all of a sudden you'd get a text message that says, staff meeting in three minutes. And you'd have guys all over the building. You might have somebody working out at lunchtime. You might have somebody meeting somebody, a player for lunch or whatever it may be. It used to just drive me crazy. Now, part of that is I'm a planner and I try and be like, probably my wife says I'm too anal when it comes to like planning and things like that. But I like a schedule and, and being organized on what you're doing as well. 
Bill Walsh, almost done here. Bill Walsh said be accountable. That was another one. Be nearsighted and farsighted was another quality that he thought you had to have to be a great leader. Bill Walsh, the head coach of the former head coach of the 49ers, be nearsighted and farsighted. Doing what's best uh, in the short term for your group that you're leading, but also long term as well. There were decisions that I made as the head coach this past season, disciplinary issues where we didn't play guys in certain games for not doing what they were supposed to be doing off the field, not being accountable. If we're going to have accountability as a core value, we're going to hold you accountable. And the easy thing, the nearsighted thing would say, oh man, we really need this guy against Kentucky or whoever to play. But if I do that, to me, I lose credibility with all the things that we're talking about. And it's not, is that, that's not what's best for the long term, being farsighted. So nearsighted, farsighted, being fair, treating people the right way, being firm um, in, in every decision that you make. Not, it's, it's black and white, and we can discuss things, but at the end of the day, when a decision's made, being firm and you're moving on, being flexible, you know, being willing to adjust on certain things. I think that's critical. You know, we, we on Friday nights before games, we have, a, you know, a schedule of how we of how we do things. And there were some things the first two or three away game or first away first game that we traveled to as a football team that the following day. I mean, we won. We, we it was after the first home game. We stay in a hotel the night before games. And it was the very next day. And some of the leaders on the team just came to talk to me about um, what, it's something simple as at Georgia before the team went into the room to eat dinner, the doors were shut. And then when the doors opened, everybody went in together. So that's what we did for the first game. Some of the players came to me on Sunday and said, do you mind if the doors are open? And if guys get down there early, they just go in there and sit down and they're at the table. Then everybody comes in, say the blessing and eat. And I didn't care, you know. Um, I think that's just a way of not always just saying, no, it's my way or the highway and being rigid, but being flexible and being willing to adjust things, not where they're running things, but where the people that you're leading feel like they have, uh, they're empowered and that they have the ability to talk to you about things and all that as well. And then belief in self and, and couldn't agree with this more is, is what Bill Walsh said. Belief in self and not having doubts. Not everything that I do is going to be the right decision, uh, but I've got to have great belief and conviction about what. I'm doing and the decisions that I'm making and being prepared. You know, I have two two signs that are that are on my desk that says essentially when you're in a leadership position, you quote, have to love making tough decisions. And you do. I mean, there's a ton of decisions that I have to make each and every day as the head coach at South Carolina. Uh, there's an old thing in coaching where when you're an assistant coach, you give suggestions. But when you're a head coach, you make decisions. And it's the same thing in any leadership. When you're the leader, you have to make decisions. Everybody else can give their suggestions, but at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to make the best decision for the entire program. And I tell our players and staff all the time that every decision I make is going to do what, it's not personal, it's going to be about what's best for the South Carolina football program. You have to love making tough decisions, and you can't make everyone happy. I got that on my, sign, on, on my office desk as well to constantly remind me that not every decision I make is going to make people happy. Somebody's going to be ticked off potentially about a decision that I make, whether it be budget or schedules or meals or uniforms, whatever it may be. Not everybody's going to be happy, but at the end of the day, you make the decision as the leader. You, you gather the, the, the facts. You make that decision, everybody moves forward, and then in between, you're doing all those things that we talked about, treating people right, being genuine, being consistent, being visible, and being a guy that people want to follow. So 